Hello viewers, I welcome you to this episode on the poetry of Emily Dickinson, a very highly regarded American poet. She has some radical views on life and death and I'm sure that at the end of this session you are going to be left with many thoughts going around in your own mind as to what your opinions might be on these very subjects. Now Emily Dickinson was one of the most famous poets that ever lived in 19th century America. She chose to live a life of seclusion, not mixing with many people, but having a very restricted social network. This was of her own choice. She never married in her lifetime, and all the time that she spent by herself was dedicated to reading extensively and also to writing poetry. She became a prolific writer of poetry, but unfortunately, most of her poems were discovered only after her death and published by her sister. Emily Dickinson lived for a very short span of time relatively from 1830 and died in the year 1886. But within this short lifespan, she was able to produce some really unique poetry. She developed a style of her own, her own signature style, you could call it, utilizing short, compact phrases which were packed with meaning and loaded with significance. And in her short poem, she was able to address far-reaching thoughts and ideas, even looking into issues like life, death, immortality and these are some of the issues which have made her poetry very controversial. People read her poems and they are provoked into greater thought and discussion. If you want to know something, one line of her poems has caused much loaded discussion among critics because it can be viewed in a whole range of ways. Today we are going to introduce you to Emily Dickinson's poem, Because I Could Not Stop for Death. Now that is not the title of the poem, that is simply the first line of it. But as Emily Dickinson did not give her poems names, we will have to do with that first line as the name of her poem. Now we shall begin to take a closer look at the poem because I could not stop for death. Death, obviously, is the theme of the poem. Now death had happened many times over and over again to Emily Dickinson because she lost several of her close friends and family members. So it's just natural and inevitable that she should become fascinated by this theme of death and we see that death informs much of her poetry. Surprisingly though, when she talks about the experience of death, it is far from frightening. In fact, she discusses death as if he were a person, in fact a gentleman, a kind and chivalrous gentleman who had come to take her on a date. The famous American philosopher, poet and critic Alan Tate has observed that the poem Because I Could Not Stop for Death is truly an extraordinary poem. In fact, Tate has said that this poem should be regarded as one of the finest in the English language because of its perfection down even to the last detail. Because I Could Not Stop for Death is a lyric poem and is made up of six stanzas. Each stanza is a quatrain, and a quatrain is just another word for a verse which has four lines. The whole poem is constructed around the metaphor or the image of a journey. Now this is a very commonplace and standard image which all of us use in our everyday speech. It is not the exclusive domain of poets or writers because we commonly refer to different aspects of our life as a journey. For example, when you talk about somebody getting an education, they might be going on a journey from ignorance to knowledge. So the person who is getting the education is the one who is taking the journey. The starting point of the journey is the point of ignorance and the destination is when he arrives at a knowledge that he is seeking. So in this way, we use the metaphor of the journey all the time. 
In this particular poem, the different slots are filled up differently by Dickinson. For example, the dead person is the one who's going on the journey. The starting place of the journey is this world, the here and the now, and the destination is eternal life. The only difference that Dickinson makes use of is that she doubles up the use of this metaphor. In this poem, life is a journey, but also death is a journey. Now you might be asking, how is that possible? It is possible because in this poem, life is a journey to death and death is a journey to eternity. So that's how Emily Dickinson makes a double use of the metaphor of the journey in Because I Could Not Stop for Death. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. We slowly drove, he knew no haste, and I had put away my labor and my leisure too for his civility. We passed the school where children strove at recess in the ring. We passed the fields of gazing green, we passed the setting sun, or rather, he passed us, the dews drew quivering and chill, for only gossamer my gown, my tippet only tulle. We paused before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible, the cornice in the ground. Since then, tis centuries, and yet feels shorter than the day, I first surmised the horses' heads were toward eternity. Emily Dickinson wastes no time in introducing us to the subject of her poem. It's death and she lets us know right in the first line itself. Now there is a certain shock value in the poet introducing death as the subject of the poem right in the first line of stanza one. The effect of this is that she gets our attention immediately. All of our focus is simply there captured in that one moment when she has told us that this is something to do with death and she's going to talk about this very serious subject in this poem. Now it's not at all common for us to find that a poem begins with the word because but it's a very significant strategy that the poet has used because the moment she begins that line with because it makes the reader feel as if she or he is involved in a dialogue with the speaker in the poem. It gives the feeling of a conversation and it engages the reader with the speaker. It's almost as if the speaker were answering a question or proposing an argument for a discussion that had come from somebody else who's in the room. It's almost like a reader had said, why? And then the speaker is saying, because this, 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 these are the reasons. So this is a very active format which has been made use of by the poet. And it gives the poem a living feel as if the poet has drawn the readers into a conversation with herself. And there is a to and fro in this conversation. There's a question and answer. There's an argument that's going on between the speaker as well as the reader. So this is a very useful mechanism that has been used by Emily Dickinson to begin the poem. It immediately gets our attention and it helps the reader to stay focused on finding out what exactly is the poet about to explain now about death. In this line, the poet says that she could not stop for death. What this means is that the poet was so busy with her life that she had no time to think about death at all. Now, how common this is with people that we see around us. Just the other day, I heard the story of a young man, just 32 years old, who was so busy with his life working in a multinational company, getting only four hours of sleep, some nights two hours of sleep. And one day, early hours of the morning, he was hit by a stroke. To his bad luck, 
He was alive for two days in the ICU and he died. Now that is tragic. Do you think this young man of 32 would ever have thought about death? I don't think so. Most of us people don't give death a thought at all. I guess that's partly because there are so many painful emotions that are associated with death, parting from loved ones, leaving things behind, and also a fear of the unknown that most of us just don't want to think about it. We push it aside out of our conscious minds and we give death no thought at all. I guess again that it's only those people who are very old or the terminally ill who actually think about death. But here the poet is telling us that because she gave no thought to death, death had to remember her. So in the very introduction, the poet is letting us know that she was not able to give any thought at all to the subject of death. This line may also suggest another aspect of death and that is that we are not given a choice as to when we want to die. Death comes at his will by some other preordained force or maybe not an ordained force but we have no hand or say in the matter of when we die. So another point which is suggested by this line is that this matter is out of our hands and it's controlled by someone else and that might be death himself. Now if you look at the text of the poem, you will notice that there are many common nouns which are capitalized by Emily Dickinson and one of them is the word death. Now in this particular instance, what Dickinson wants to do is to personify death. Now this is a figure of speech which is used in poetry called personification. Personification simply means to give the attributes or the qualities of an individual or a human being to something which is not a human being. So in this case, when Dickinson personifies death, what she's doing is simply that she's representing death as if he were a person. And when we go into the poem, you will see that she represents him as a man and a very chivalrous and kind man. That's what we will learn in line two. For more notes on personification, you can look to the end of this lesson. At the end of this line, you will notice a small dash. Now these small dashes are what we have to get used to in this poem because you'll find them very often. And they are a kind of a link by which Dickinson takes us from one idea down to the next idea which will follow through in the following line. Line two says, he kindly stopped for me. Now here is an absolutely new take on death. death and kind, I don't think you've ever heard these two words go together before. We always think of death as being very harsh and very cruel and no matter how old the people are whom we lose to death, no matter how sick, we never think that death is a kind gentleman. But here in line two, Dickinson is presenting death as being kind. And the rationale behind this is that death was thinking of her. In the busyness of her life, in the structure of the plan of her schedule, her work, her leisure, she had never stopped to think about death. But yet, death was so kind to her that he had come and thought about her and stopped to come and get her. And that's the reason why Emily Dickinson portrays death as being kind, which leads us on to the next idea, and that is that death is a trustworthy gentleman who is chivalrous. Now she sees death as being a man who has been given a job. His job is simply to come and collect a person and take them somewhere else. This gives us some clues as to the perception of Dickinson. Obviously, as many of us think about death as the end of life, Dickinson is not on that same level. She is thinking of death as a continuation into some other 
extended life or an afterlife if you may and she is seeing or perceiving death as the agent who will take her from this life to the other life and that probably is also the explanation for the tone of the poem which is set in line two and this tone is one of great peace and calm as death is not perceived as something which is very daunting or frightening or something intimidating but rather kind and gentle we can see that the tone of this whole poem is very calm and very peaceful and that setting of tone is accomplished in line two of the poem. Lines three and four. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. Now in these two lines, the poet begins by saying that she was conscious in the beginning of just death and herself being in the carriage. But with that little dash at the end of line three and the pause, there is a moment of pregnant suspense in which we are left hanging. It's almost as if the poet is saying, I think there's just death and me, but oh wait, wait, I sense that there's someone else. And then that suspense drops us into line four, where the poet discovers that there is indeed one more person and that person is immortality. You will notice that in these two lines, the poet has capitalized three words which are common nouns, making them into proper nouns. They are carriage, ourselves and immortality. This does not mean that the poet is personifying these three non-living things as she did in the case of death in line one. It simply means that she wants our attention on these three objects and she's paying them a special place of importance. Now let's begin with the word carriage. This is no ordinary carriage. There are carriages and there are carriages, but this carriage is a hearse. In fact, it is the death chariot of the poet. So it is a different kind of a carriage. It is something which is not normal. It's not your average carriage. It is something which is on a mission, on an assignment, which is going to take her from this life into another life, which she imagines as an afterlife. And so it's a different kind of a carriage. Let's look at ourselves. Now, when we use the word ourselves, this personal pronoun gives a sense of intimacy. It gives a sense of relationship. So it's almost as if a relationship has already been established between death and the poet. And that's really what the poet wants to convey. And the two of them are enclosed in one carriage when suddenly they discover the third person who is immortality. Now immortality is the most complicated and interesting word out of all these three in the two lines. When we discover in line four that immortality is in the carriage, we might want to stop and ask, hey, what's immortality doing there in the carriage? Because remember, the poem is supposed to be about death and death is related to mortality. So one might well ask, why isn't mortality there in the carriage? But the truth is the poet has declared that it is immortality. Now this gives us a very important clue again to the poet's feelings. Obviously, the poet is looking as death as a transition. She's looking at death not as something dreaded, not as something sorrowful, not as a severing of re relationships, not at all as something that involves a lot of pain, but rather she's looking as death as a stepping stone to something better. This is the clue we get from her inclusion of the word immortality in line four instead of mortality. So this is probably also the reason why the poet is not feeling upset about death stopping by to collect her. In fact, 
it looks like she's ready to enjoy the ride with him and she's treating this almost like one would treat going out on a date with somebody and she's quite looking forward to this journey and wherever it's going to take her from where she is right now at this present time. Stanza 2, line 5. We slowly drove, he knew no haste. This line indicates that they were really taking their time in going to wherever they wanted to go. The beginning word of the line is we and it might give us the feeling that the poet as well as death both had some control over the speed at which they were traveling. But in order to correct this perception, Dickinson quickly says he knew no haste. This gives us a very clear indicator that death was in the driving seat. He is the one who was calling the shots on this journey. And it again puts us into perspective that death is the one who was taking her and she was simply the passive person going on this journey. The slow pace does two things for the poem. Firstly, it continues that feeling of calm and peace and shows that there's no rush, there's no tension, there's no anxiety regarding this journey. And the second thing it does is it builds up suspense because now we're beginning to wonder where is this journey taking the passenger? In fact, where is it ever going to end? Lines 6 to 8 And I put away my labour and my leisure too for his civility. Lines 6 to 8 tell us that the poet happily gave up all her work as well as all her entertainment and hobbies and all her other activities because she was so impressed with the chivalrous and kind behaviour of death. Now we can see this in two ways when it says for his civility, we can see it either that she gave it up because death was so charming, because death had taken the trouble to come and get her, because death had remembered her even though she had never thought about him, or we can see it another way that she had replaced all her work and all her leisure activity by this journey that she was now undertaking with death. Either way, we can see that the poet is truly at peace regarding her giving up all of these things which are concerning life because life concerns work as well as leisure. So she had set life aside and was now undertaking the journey with death. So either way, she's happy to do that. She almost seems to anticipate it in a very positive fashion and she goes with a calmness of mind and a peace in her heart, knowing that whatever it is that's on the other side of death, it's something that she is looking forward to. It's something that in some way she sees as better than the work and the leisure which she's leaving behind in this life. Stanza 3 lines 9 and 10. We passed the school where children strove at recess in the ring. Dickinson is painting a little scene for us here and it's a scene that's familiar to every one of us. Each one of us has passed by a school and watched the children playing in the schoolyard. It's a common enough scene but in its very normalcy is an eeriness because when you look at it from the side of the poet and the driver of the chariot, they are watching an everyday scene in the life of several youngsters. But when you look at it from the other side, it becomes very spooky. Now what if you were a child in the playground and you were looking out to the road and you saw some cars and carriages pass by, but not all of them were your everyday cars and carriages. In fact, some of those carriages were being driven by death and the passengers in them were moving from life into afterlife. Now that would be a different scene altogether. The lines also bring out the mundane routine of stress in life and the fact that this stress begins right there in our very childhood. And what is worse, that stress and that routine is in the playground at recess, in the break time. 
Now, why does the poet tell us that even the recess time of children is stressful? Is it really so? I would highly agree with Dickinson in this view. Because if you look at our leisure time activities, stress is built into the very nature of them. Now, if you were a basketball player, you would be highly stressed and concentrating upon getting that ball into the basket. If you were playing golf or hockey, you would be trying to make scores. If it was cricket, you would be desperately trying to hit a six. Look at the stress that's built in even even into our leisure activities. The way human beings have structured their lives is such that even leisure has today become very stressful. If you look at some of the high adrenaline sports activities, it's even worse where people go skiing and mountain climbing and parachuting and all those kinds of activities which are supposed to relieve the stress of our everyday lives. But I think in turn, they make our lives that much more stressful. Now the poet says that the children were playing at recess in the ring. Many critics who have studied this poem have felt that the ring refers to the common childhood game Ringer Ringer Roses, which probably all of you have already heard about, played in your childhood that game, enjoyed it and uh, you know you remember it well. Now in that game Ringer Ringer Roses it goes Hushes, bushes, we all fall down. Now therein, the poet is pulling out that symbolism of falling down and likening it to death. Even though we all play the game, we must all one day fall down. And just because we are afraid of falling down, we cannot say that we will not play the game. So we do play the game knowing fully well that one day we will succumb to death. And so this is how Emily Dickinson brings in the structures of life. She's going to talk about stress and the routine of life through the different stages of our lives, right from childhood into adulthood and from adulthood into old age. But what she seems to suggest in this line is that the stress of life, whether it be in our labor, in our work, or even in our playtime and in our leisure, that stress begins way down in our childhood and continues with us through life almost to the very end. Most people are striving and struggling even close to their deathbeds. And that is what it seems to me that Emily Dickinson wants to portray as a contrast to the afterlife that she's optimistically looking forward to. Perhaps this routine will not be there. Perhaps this striving will not be there. Perhaps this struggle will be over once we leave this life. And this is the suggestion that she's bringing forth, making us pay attention to the children who are not even in their classrooms. If they were striving in their classrooms, that's something that we could understand. But this is not their classroom. This is the play field. And even on the play field, children are striving. Apart from striving to achieve, many times children are striving to get attention of adults. Many times children want to be included in the cool gang. All these are the stressors which make life so tough even for our little children. Now you may want to know, why is Dickinson bringing life and death together here in this particular line? I think the answer is very simple. She wants us to confront the reality and the truth that death is a part of life. So unless we see it as such, we will be like her. She never wanted to think about death. She had laid that thought aside and it had to come to the point where death remembered her. Death thought about her and came to get her. So in this scene of confrontation, I think Emily Dickinson wants us to realize that every one of us must give some thought to death. As you would have seen by this time, the poem, Because I Could Not Stop for Death, is so intense that every line is loaded with meaning. Every word is significant. It is 
packed with stuff for us to unwrap and unload. And so we are going to continue and finish this poem in another session. And I really look forward to seeing you in that episode when we will conclude the study of Emily Dickinson's wonderful and amazing poem, Because I Could Not Stop for Death.